Hey everybody, Austin back again with another Let's Play video. Today it's going to be Shadow of the Beast on the Sega Genesis. Now, this is one of those games that, among Genesis fans, is typically deemed one of the most difficult games on the platform. Uh, especially the American version, because it actually runs faster than the, uh, the original European version. And, uh, you know what? Um, I think it, it is kind of a challenging game, but it's definitely not impossible. And in this video, what I'm going to do is try to run through the game uh, in one sitting and complete it while I'm talking to you guys at the same time. Um, Shadow of the Beast, yeah, it's a difficult game, but it's one of those games where when you memorize the patterns and you know exactly what's coming at you, you can totally dominate the game. And so what I'm going to do is, I'm really familiar with this game. I actually used to play it a lot back in high school, about 13 years ago, as of recording this. And, uh, you know, back then I had memorized all the patterns and I was eventually able to complete the game. And now that I've actually revisited it uh, about 13 years later, today, in 2013, I have, um, you know, given it some more practice and, you know, I've actually sort of uh, modified my game and how I play and I think it's actually even easier for me now than it was back when I first memorized how to play it. So uh, let's go ahead and get right into the game. I'll start talking about it as I play. I'll try to describe the game for new people that haven't played it before. Uh, Shadow of the Beast is a side-scrolling sort of action platformer. It's actually kind of hard to describe uh, the style of game it is because it's, it's a very unique game actually to be honest with you. Um, and uh, yeah, you have a, a couple of basic functions. You can punch and you can actually hold your fist out. Unfortunately, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it doesn't actually register as a hit if you hold your hand out, so don't do that. You basically want to tap the button and let it go as quickly as you can. And you can't really mash the button either. If you mash the button in this game, as I'm doing right now, uh, your punches will actually come out rather inconsistently. So this is one of those games where precision is rewarded. Uh, so what I like to do is tap, 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 tap individually, and you actually punch faster. Um, you can also jump by pressing the C button, and if you press the attack button while you're in the air, you'll do a jump kick. Uh, now the jump kick, you can actually delay it. You can, um, you can sort of kick right at the peak of your jump, or you can sort of jump kick as you're going up, and it'll still reg register the hit as you're going up. And it should register the hit uh, for at least a few frames while your foot is out. Um, so what I like to do to make attacking enemies easier is do a jump kick into them instead of punching them. If you punch an enemy in this game, you have to be like almost right on the frame uh, of, of connecting with the enemy in order to actually register a hit. Otherwise, the enemy is probably going to tumble right through you. You'll take damage. And yeah, taking damage in this game, trust me, isn't, isn't good for the most part. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it as far as functions. That's it. It's just punch, jump, and jump kick. Uh, you can also duck. Um, the game is a little slow uh, for you to turn around, so that's something to keep in mind when you're playing this game. And when you're ducking, you cannot turn around while you're ducking. You have to get back up, turn back around, like this. Um, so Shadow of the Beast, again, like I said, it's a game that sort of rewards uh, precision. And you definitely are going to need a lot of precision when you play this game. Um, Memorization is going to help you a lot, but you're going to need precision on top of that memorization in order to be successful in this game. Okay, now going on from there, uh, you know, when you first get into the game, you're like, well, what am I doing? I'm just walking around. Uh, and your first instinct is to actually go right. That's actually not what you want to do in this game. Uh, Shadow of the Beast is basically just one big open world. You can go anywhere you want. Uh, it's not a huge world. It's actually kind of small. You can beat this game in about 15 minutes. Um, but if you go right, you're going to get to a part of the game, you're going to need some items and blah blah blah, you're not going to be able to complete the game if you go to the right. Uh, so essentially you have to go left first. So let's go left, and we're going to have a bunch of enemies start to pop out. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is actually trying to jump kick through most of the enemies as they, as they come up. Uh, they do come from behind you, so you definitely have to watch out for that. There's a big bat, there's another boulder. Um, it's probably going to be another bat. Yeah, another bat. Oh, I got hit. Um, and then that should be it. I don't think there's any more enemies. Uh, there's this house right here, or tree. You can actually press up to go into it. 
A kind of interesting note is um, if you keep running to the left, you'll just sort of hit an invisible wall. I can't go over any further. In uh, the Atari Lynx version of this game, there's actually a big row of spikes here, and if you run into the spikes, you die in one hit. Kind of cool and kind of creepy, actually, at the same time. Um, I'm not sure how the original Amiga version was, if there were spikes over there or if it just was an invisible wall, but um, every, every version of Shadow of the Beast was a little bit different from one another. Uh, so let's go ahead and go up. And uh, in this version, there's, you know, text and whatnot before you go into each area, which I think is actually kind of cool. Uh, Shadow of the Beast is actually a very moody game in terms of, uh, well, just the visual style as a whole. It's kind of creepy. And then you've got sort of the, the brooding music on top of it. And um, and then combined with the text that they, they mentioned, it's, it's somewhat descriptive, even though it's only a few sentences. Uh, it kind of it helps with that moodiness of the game. I always thought that was kind of cool. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and let those text sequences sort of roll out as I as I play through this game. So yeah, this is sort of the main first level, so to say. I don't really like to call it uh, a level because again, the game is sort of open ended and there's no time limit or anything like that. So I mean, if I wanted to, I could just try to go back even though the staircase is kind of stuck up there, so I can't get back that specific way. But if I really wanted to, uh, you know, I can just sort of go at this whole thing at my own pace. And um, some of these uh, sort of pseudo dungeons have a couple alternate paths, nothing too crazy. Like if I wanted to, I could go up this uh, ladder, but I don't want to do that. I actually want to go down this ladder. And um, when I play this game, I actually have a very, very specific sort of path I like to take every time I play the game. Uh, especially if I'm just trying to bolt through the game and beat it as quickly as I can. And uh, but right now, you know, I'm doing a let's play and talking and whatnot, so I'm definitely playing a lot slower than I normally do. So we're gonna have to actually go over uh, to this place, uh, but we want to do that last. So what you want to do is come down here, go down this ladder, and work our way all the way to the left over here, killing the enemies as they come. Uh, you don't really want to touch anything in this game. Uh, like you see, I just got hit by that water, I guess, and I got hurt by it. Uh, so pretty much anything that moves in this game, do not touch it uh, unless you're attacking it. Because everything is out to kill you in this game. So here we've got this key. This is actually necessary to progress. And uh, throughout the game you have these potions, and when you collect these, they typically restore all of your health. And this one's going to restore all of my health. You do have smaller potions uh, throughout the game as well, which will only restore a couple of hit points. Now, if you look in the top left-hand corner of the screen, uh, you see a number 12. And that's actually the amount of hit points I have. Uh, every hit in this game takes away one point. Fortunately, thankfully, it's only one point. Uh, if it was more than that, this game would be absolutely insanely brutal. Um, but yeah, I basically have 12 hits until I die. But there are some potions throughout the game that'll refill it to 12. So, you know, throughout the course of the whole game, you might have, you know, you might be able to take 30 to 40 something hits uh, before you get a game over. Now, when you get a game over in this game, it is literally game over. Uh, and you have to start from the very beginning. So that's actually one of the really frustrating parts about this game. Uh, and actually, when I was trying to refamiliar my, I'm sorry, refamiliarize myself with this game uh, last week, uh, I would get about halfway through the game, get a game over, and then have to start over again. And what starting over again basically means is having to go through this whole first dungeon over and over again. Um, which this dungeon is easy for me; I can always get through it. So it's just like, ah, I've got to go through this whole dungeon again just to get to the second dungeon. Um, you know, to practice the patterns again and hope I survive. So it's it can get frustrating really fast, especially if you're, you know, uh, short-tempered like me sometimes. Okay, so we're going to walk through this thing. This will actually teleport us right before the, the pseudo mini-boss. Uh, I don't really like to call enemies bosses in this game. They're just sort of like really big obstacles, and they have very specific ways to get past them. Uh, and this guy in particular, you had to gather this, or I'm sorry, grab this orb, which allows you to shoot a projectile. Now the projectile is actually limited on ammunition. Actually, I don't know if it's ammunition is limited on or if it's limited on time, but if you get it too early, you'll actually run out of it. And so when you get to this guy, it's necessary to have this projectile. 
and if you don't have it, you can't beat this guy. And if you touch him, you die in one hit. Now, there's quite a few enemies in the game that'll kill you in one hit, so you have to be extremely careful in this game. Uh, and you also have to be wise about the order that you pick your items up in. Um, so, like I said, when I got to that first sort of split section area where I can go down a left-hand ladder or go down the right-hand ladder, if I went down the left-hand ladder first and picked up that orb, I would have run out of it by the time I got to that guy and I would have had to start the whole game over. So, uh, if you're, you know, not too familiar with this game and you're interested in, in trying to play it, Definitely watch all the way through this video, watch what I do, and it'll make life a lot easier when you go and actually try to play the game. And I think the game will actually be more enjoyable because you sort of won't have to figure everything out yourself. Uh, you won't have to figure any everything out for yourself. Uh, some might see that as a bad thing because, you know, part of the fun in playing games is learning them. You know, going through trial and error and figuring it out yourself. But this game is, <laughs> is a lot of trial and error. Um, Although there is, I think, an invincibility code you could probably use, uh, but I don't know what that is, so... I did it the hard way. <laughs> okay, uh, this is actually sort of another trick I wanted to sort of show you guys, is there's a potion here. And again, potions refill all of your health, or at least these sort of yellowish ones. So, there's going to be this sort of stop and go section right here. But what I'm going to do is, because I have full HP, I'm just gonna run through these guys, take the damage, sort of just act like a tank. So I've gotten hit three times already. <clears throat> and I'm gonna do the same thing going back. Six, five, four. I still have four hits left. So basically what I did is I saved the potion, took all that damage, and bam, look at that. My life is back at uh, 12 hit points. So, it's a good little trick to know, um, and definitely keep that in mind as you're playing this game if you if you decide to check this game out. Or if, you know, you've already checked this game out before and, you know, you're still pseudo-interested in it, but maybe you, you've never gotten very far into it. Uh, so, there's actually a couple of points in this game where you can use little tricks like that. And uh, there's actually one section on um, the second dungeon, so to say, where... Um, well, I'll just explain it as I get there, as to not sort of get too far ahead of myself. There's some little uh, Psygnosis uh, sort of uh, owl icons. It was sort of like uh, their mascot in a way. Um, so they make an appearance in this game. <laughs> Don't touch them though, you'll get hurt. <laughs> All right. Man, this is like more like a walkthrough Let's Play as opposed to just like me playing the game and talking at the same time. Okay, if you saw those sort of like brown, weird looking skull things, they're gonna pop back out of the ground. But what I want to do is actually inch forward and, um, and make them pop out. And you have to get your timing just right. As you heard it, I went bam, 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 bam. And if you don't get that timing just right, you'll miss, you'll get hit by one. The reason I wanted to stop and do that is because this guy right here. This bug dude. Now basically what happens is um, you need to time uh, your attacks perfectly for those skull things that come into the ground. But when that bug thing's flying, he doesn't fly in synchronization with the other guys that are coming out at you. So what's going to happen is you're probably going to end up taking a hit by him. Or if you try to hit him, you're going to miss one of the skull things that's coming at you. So inching forward in this game is also really, really useful. There's another potion. Uh, this this dungeon is actually pretty uh, generous with the potions and so forth. And from this point on, there aren't too many more enemies. There's these little slinky looking things and uh, uh, sort of bug thing that just flew across the screen. There's this guy right here, really easy enemy, just punch him. And go up here, and we've basically got this ghost, and you can just punch or jump kick him. And then that's it, that's all the enemies uh, for the rest of this dungeon, except for the main pseudo mini boss you'll see me fight. And I'm going to try to take the mini boss down uh, really, really fast, and I'll show you what I mean by that.
Now this actually potion I got up there, it's actually sort of like a power fist. If you uh, can see my fist, it's sort of glowing. And that was the potion I grabbed up at the top, uh, going up that one ladder. That wasn't actually a life potion. It was like this sort of mega fist, whatever you want to call it. And it's necessary to defeat this guy that's coming up right here. And you got some these spike things. They constantly go back and forth. But what I'm going to do is try to time my attacks to kill this guy before I get hit. Got it. Right before that one spike would have come up and got me, I uh, managed to kill him. All right, we're going back up this ladder. <clears throat> you emerge from the darkness into sunlight again. However, it is late in the evening. Oh, late in the day, sorry. <laughs> and the shadows are growing longer. It is also becoming uncomfortably warm. You know, nothing too extremely detailed, but it kind of sets the pace for the next sort of stretch in the game, which I always thought was kind of cool. Now, when you start the game, you could actually go into here, but what will happen is... You'll get to the bottom, but the doorway I went through is it will actually be locked. So you can't actually go back there from the very beginning of the game. You have to go all the way over to the left-hand side of the, the map and enter from you know, the appropriate entrance. But if I wanted to, I can go back down now and go back through that stage uh, going backwards uh, because I the door's uh, permanently unlocked. So, but there's no point in doing that, so. All right, now this part is basically a long stretch of land with tons of enemies that come flying at you. And I don't know why I'm stopping to punch these guys. I should just be jump kicking them to uh, sort of get through it faster. I like jump kicking the enemies because one, it's a tad bit safer, but uh, you also keep your movement going, you keep your motion going, and I'm not paying attention. <laughs> like, just keep going. Kind of Ninja Gaiden style, where I just run and slice through enemies while I'm jumping. You just keep your motion going, which I like doing in games that I can do that in. So bam, just keep going. Unfortunately, you can't jump kick guys that are sort of crawling along the ground, so you have to actually stop and hit them. <clears throat> now, these things right here, if you don't punch them, they'll actually stay here, and each one actually gives me two hit points back. So what I'm going to do is actually save these. If I end up taking a lot of hits, I can walk back... Uh, get four hit points back and then try the little section over again because enemies do respawn uh... These eyeball things you cannot kill so just you have to sort of just you know dodge them they go in and out in and out in and out This is a very patternistic game um, thankfully. <laughs> it's not too randomized at all, really. Um, there are a couple sections where, you know, a whole swarm of enemies will come at you, and it'll seem pretty much unavoidable. But, uh, for the most part, it's very patternistic. You just stop, go, stop, go, watch enemies appear, watch them disappear, and you base your movements around that. So these guys come up, they go back down. So once they go back down, you cross. So it's pretty easy, uh, you know, to control the game, so to say. Um, as you can see, the hitbox could be a little generous sometimes on certain enemies. Uh, a lot of enemies you have to be dead precise, but some enemies have bigger hitboxes. Uh, which, is, which is actually kind of nice. Like, that guy didn't have a very big hitbox, basically. The left sa left hand side of his mouth, like on that pixel, you had that you had to touch him. Whereas the guys that had the clubs, I think when they put put the clubs out, that whole part where the club is out from the club down is actually their hitbox. So, uh, you know, certain enemies like that have pretty generous hitboxes. So we'll go ahead and let this text roll out, and then I think this is actually the last set of text in the game. I don't think there's any other text. <clears throat> I 
The air is thick with moisture. Setting the tone. Now this place is actually pretty brutal. And I had to practice this place a lot. And the place is actually kind of creepy as well. It's really dark color. A really dark color palette. Uh, the music is kind of, you know, brooding. And uh, there's lots of enemies that are in seemingly crazy patterns at first. But, you know, when you play it a lot, you kind of figure out, oh, it's not that bad to get through. So this thing, uh, this guy's dropping these sort of lightning things or electrical things and uh, they burst and um, if you touch the blue beam, you get hurt. So what I'm gonna do, as you can see, he just comes out, drops it, comes out, drops it, rinse and repeat. I could just leave this on all day and it would, it would, I could probably go to sleep for 12 hours, come back and he'd still be doing the same thing. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is try to jump over it as it's going to get a head start. And as long as you keep running, he uh, shouldn't be able to catch up to you. Just like that. Now this little uh, sort of slinky, spring, snaky thing that's going back and forth, you can actually sort of punch him, but it's actually hard to time the attack on this guy. So what I like to do is actually just jump kick over him and go just like that. And there's going to be a health potion right here. Got it. Now there's going to be some sort of spike uh, sword things that come flying down from both sides and you just duck and you will avoid it. Actually, you might not even have to duck, but ducking gives you a little bit of extra uh, clearance. There's going to be some guys that sort of, uh, you know, come up from the ground and throw some like uh, knives at me. But uh, I don't remember the exact pattern on these guys, so I just take the damage as, as such. I used to know the pattern for that part. Uh, a lot of this... You know, a lot of most of this game I used to be able to get through without getting hit because I knew the exact patterns, but I don't, you know, some of it is still foggy to me these days. This guy, you can just duck and hit him. Uh, these guys, they shoot arrows out, so you want to hit them when they are, are not shooting. Oh, that was a bad idea. Why did I do that? That was stupid. That was, yeah, really stupid. <laughs> All right, there's a wrench right here I just picked up, and that's necessary to get through this uh, electrical barrier, you'll see, uh, in just a little bit. Oh, timed that wrong. It's gonna be a snake, and if I jump kick through it, only one will appear. What's kind of interesting in this, in this game is if you jump kick through certain enemies and you keep your motion going, um, there will be less enemies that appear. Like on that part, there were supposed to be two snakes. Uh, if I went up and just punched him and waited for him to disappear off the screen, if I walked forward again, there would be a second snake. But since I jump kicked through him, I guess since the, uh, the original snake was still on the screen, sort of falling off as I was moving, uh, the other snake didn't spawn. He probably spawns after the other snake disappears off the screen. At least I'm assuming that's how it works. It's the only logical thing that comes to mind. So, yeah, basically by jump kicking through him, I did not trigger uh, the other enemy. Like that part should have had more enemies than that. But since I jump kicked through them, oops, no problems. So, all right, so we're actually... Uh, getting kind of close we're eh, probably about halfway through where i need to be right now um i'm going to actually end up having to show you a trick oops oh come on double come on man all right down the four hit points all right so this part i have to be really careful Oh man, two hits left. All right, now we've got a gun and I have two hits and I need to make sure that I survive for two more hits, otherwise it's game over. 
And with the gun, what I like to do is constantly shoot ahead of me. But you can only shoot two shots on, uh, you can only have two shots on screen at once. So you don't want to shoot both shots out. You want to be prepared to turn back behind you to shoot whatever comes up uh, behind you. Now this part, there's going to be really fast sort of projectiles coming my way. So I have to m rapidly press the button like so. And you want to press down here to activate your wrench, which removes the, uh, the beam. <clears throat> so again, I have two more hits. Okay, I I'm in a good standing now. We're back at the beginning. Now I'm going to show you a trick that you probably weren't supposed to be able to do, but it was probably an oversight on the developer's part. Now if you go back out... We'll just skip that. You'll be back out, but when I go back in, all the potions and such will have respawned. So since I only have two hit points, what I'm going to do is go back to that top part, grab the potion, and loop back around. And by the time I get back to where I was, I should have more hit points than I do now. And I'm going to need those hit points in order to progress. Uh, but one thing I did want to show you is when you're outside and you've got the gun, I, again, I don't think... Uh, it was really intended for you to come back out here after you've got the gun. You cannot shoot when you're outside, but when you try to, you sort of do like a floating jump kick, like... Like the game doesn't really know what to do, and when you jump kick in the air, you sort of disappear for a quick second. Uh, so I thought that would be kind of neat to show you. So, let's go back in. Wow, it's been 27 minutes already. I just looked at the time, and I was like, man, I would have uh, beaten this game already about uh, 10 minutes ago at least. Um, so we're going to basically do the same thing as last time, but now that I got the gun, it'll be a lot easier. I won't even have to jump anymore. Whoa, that was close. And this guy, I should be able to shoot him. Just like so. And now we're, it's pretty much smooth sailing from here on out now, uh, because I've got the full life potion. Just like so. And I could basically shoot to my heart's content. There's no ammunition on this. It's unlimited. Thankfully. <laughs> you still have to be careful, though. So. See, there's two snakes there. You can see them off the corner of the screen. And so there will probably be more enemies here. Nope. There may have been had I had to actually stop and shoot. So there we go. I've got 10 hit points. Now if I really wanted to, I can go back out and come back in and do it again and hope that I don't get hit. But since I don't know that one pattern where the guys come out of the ground and throw knives at me, you know, that's like guaranteed hit oh guaranteed getting hit right there so i'm not going to worry about it um oh now they're going to be guys in the ceiling tossing sort of axes down so you want to oops i'm not paying attention you want to wait for them to throw them out and then progress why did not that not hit that guy damn man the hit detection could be a little wonky with the gun so that's something to be aware of all right, there's going to be some more missiles coming up, or more projectiles. Just like so. I mean, that's an example where you have to know it's coming up, otherwise you're, you're guaranteed to get hit. It's just that sort of thing. So, all right, now we're at the next sort of pseudo boss, and this is actually kind of a pain. Uh, if you have a lot of hit points, you can act... Ooh, God, I didn't even see that coming. If you have a lot of hit points, you can sort of tank this guy. Or tank against this guy. But uh, I'm not going to do that right now. I want to try to save all the hit points I can. And you have to really watch his pattern. You have to let the pro projectiles get in there and touch the little yellow part on him. And it's a little tricky. Because the fireballs that come out of his mouth, they're not synchronized. They don't, you know, like one... They're they're all sort of like timed a little bit differently, so they get mixed up, and it's hard to predict um, when they're going to uh, be shot out. Now he should be dead in the next hit or two. 
I predict this next hit. Oh, close. Two more hits. Okay, so we're in good standing. We've got five hit points, and the reason I say that is that there are going to be some uh, objects I can destroy here that'll give me a couple hit points back per. And we are basically at the second to last part of the game. After I get through this sort of shmup section... Ooh, that was bad. After I get past the shooter section, we'll be at the uh, the final stretch in the game, which really shouldn't be that hard at all. Oh, crap. Alright, so let me focus here so I can get through this without dying, because... <laughs> yeah. Two hit points. Two hit points. So I'm up to nine. So now I'm in good standing. And this thing is kind of hard to get through. Uh, you got to time it just right on, on the entrance of it. Ah, so that's one of those parts right there where I don't remember how to dodge it exactly. Damn, that was stupid. What I like to do is when I'm going through this is waving up and down. Doing kind of like that. Um... Alright, so here's like another sort of mini boss. Kind of like the dragon, you have to get the bullets inside of him, you have to scroll the screen over, otherwise it's not going to register. Uh, see, those didn't register at all. He has to blink for it to register. And what I like to do is just focus on one side, uh, the top side, and just repeat the pattern over and over. You don't want to touch him because you will get hurt. But yeah, the, the quote-unquote bosses in this game, they're not really that difficult as long as you're uh, you're uh, okay with, you know, just following a, a simple pattern over and over. So, there we go. All right, now we're at the last stretch in the game. And, uh, the, uh, whoa. The enemies definitely come out uh, a little bit quicker here. Okay. Now, there are these tombstones here. Uh, there's gonna be three the ones on the outside the left and the far right one will give you uh, hit points The one in the middle will actually take away hit points. You don't want to grab the one in the middle <laughs> It's actually bad so All right, I'm gonna have to actually just kind of focus here in order to get ah, got hit All right, so two hit points Two hit points. Don't want to grab the one in the middle. It'll take away two hit points. Alright, now this guy, it's really simple. Just bash him, but don't get hit by the big club. And this is basically the final boss in the game. <laughs> it's actually pretty pathetic compared to, to uh, the rest of the game. And that's it! Congratulations! You have freed yourself from the Shadow of the Beast. And the ending is literally like 15 seconds long and then it reverts back to the title screen. Um... <laughs> So there you have it guys, Shadow of the Beast on the Sega Genesis in full. Uh, if you've never played this game before, or if you have played this game and, you, and you've sort of witnessed the frustrating aspects of it firsthand, uh, you know, hopefully I've I helped you out a little bit. Hopefully you can go back to the game, revisit it, and maybe have less of a difficult time uh, with it. So, 
But, uh, you know, I actually really, really like this game. I, I kind of grew fond of it back in high school. I don't really know why. Um, I think it was just the theme. Now, it, I think it was just mainly the theme. It was, uh, like I said earlier on in the video, it's kind of dark and brooding, and there wasn't really anything quite like it on the Sega Genesis that I had played in terms of, like, that mood. And I remember playing it as, you know, in, in my sort of mid to late years of high school, and I would play it with headphones on on my Sega CDX that I had back then, and I would play it in the dark, and it actually kind of creeps me out because it's so moody, and you play it with all the lights off, the sounds blasting. Like once you get out to the uh, the main the main open land, when you're walking to the right, and that fast like do 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 do, like that fast music kicks on. It's kind of like kind of creepy. It like it. I don't know. It no other Genesis game really set a mood like that for me. That kind of like creeps me out. And it's not even that scary or anything like that. It's just out of this world and outlandish, you know. Uh, so I kind of grew partial to the game, and through playing it like that, and just sort of getting immersed in the mood of the game, uh, I eventually learned the patterns and so forth, and tried to make it farther and farther uh, the more I played the game. And then eventually I beat it. Um, and then that was a, a big achievement, because it took me a lot of practice to beat it. And then I was able to beat it again and again, and then I got to the point where I could pretty much do it every single time I played the game, uh, like right now. Uh, when I first uh, played this game a couple days ago, uh, I was actually really rusty. I, I died a lot. I probably tried beating the game about 10 or 15 times. And then that 16th or 17th time, it, it clicked, and I, I finally uh, managed to get through it. And then I did it again, and then again. I probably beat the game three or four times getting prepped for this Let's Play. Uh, just to make sure I could beat it while I was uh, talking to you guys about it. So... But yeah, that's sort of my own personal journey slash story with Shadow of the Beast. Uh, there was a sequel to the game, and, uh, you know, it's on the Genesis, it's also on the Sega CD. And to be honest, I wasn't really a huge fan of it. It's a relatively... I don't want to say it's totally different, but it just doesn't feel the same. Um, yeah, uh, I beat it on the Sega CD, and I just wasn't a huge fan of it. Um, but then again, I was actually kind of spoiled by this one. Oh, I don't really know if spoiled is the right word, but... I was conditioned with this version of Shadow of the Beast. This was the first version of Shadow of the Beast I ever played. And apparently, uh, this game was developed, uh, you know, for the 50 Hertz PAL regions. And when they brought it over to America, they didn't adjust the, uh, the clock difference. It, uh, you know, in America, everything runs at 60 Hertz, or at least the Sega Genesis runs at 60 Hertz. So, they didn't adjust the game, and as a result, the game, our version, ended up running a good bit faster than the European version. And basically what that did is it, it made an already difficult game even more difficult. Uh, you had to be much uh, faster with your reflexes, and, you know, I, I, a lot of people use that as a reason, you know, for this game being as difficult as it is. But the point of that is, is that I was used to the speed of this game, like the accuracy required, and Shadow of the Beast 2, it, it felt so much slower. And, you know, it, part of that is that it was probably actually, it's running at, you know, designed for, or it was adjusted for the American market, and it runs sort of slow, like the European version does. And, you know, that was one reason why I didn't care for Shadow of the Beast Part 2 as well. Um, but it is, uh... A little bit different in how it executes its uh, its puzzles and so far. I think you even have to talk to people in that game. It was it was different. Um, and then there was also a Shadow of the Beast Part Three, which I believe only came out on Amiga computers. Uh, I think it was just the Amiga, and uh, so I've never actually played that, and I don't know if it's any good or not. I haven't even seen any videos on it. I, We'll definitely need to check that out, but, uh... I did play some other versions of the first Shadow of the Beast, though. Um, one of them was the Atari Lynx version. And, uh, I actually really, really, really like the Atari Lynx version. Uh, it's slower, as it's supposed to be. But, the Lynx had, uh, built-in hardware scaling, and Shadow of the Beast actually took advantage of that. So, every time you walked into, uh, a new dungeon or a map, the doorway that you walk into like scales up and it like zooms in 
Kind of like Mode 7 on a Super Nintendo, but the Lynx usually did that scaling a lot better than even the Super Nintendo. If, if the scaling on the Lynx was always, it always felt a little more natural. Um, whereas in a lot of Super Nintendo games, it felt kind of forced uh, in, in some cases. But uh, uh, the Lynx version also has some extra stuff. Like I mentioned, if you walk all the way to the far left hand corner of the map, and in this version, you hit an invisible wall, but in the, the Atari Lynx version, there's spikes, and they're like bloodied spikes. It's, it's kind of cool. So if you touch the spikes, you die. So that, that actually makes the game even more brooding than even this version is. There's just some really cool stuff in there. When you get a game over, it shows like bones and stuff like that, like your carcass and whatnot. It's really cool stuff. Um, and um, the music was also great in the Lynx version. I think it's actually even better than it is in this version. I like the renditions of the audio tracks there. Uh, and the animation as a whole, like how the beast runs and how all the enemies animate is very, very smooth. It's a really great port of the game. Uh, I also played the Master System version. I had that back in the day because I was a fan of this, so I bought the European Master System version. And to be honest, I, yeah, it's a version of the game. I don't really recommend it if you can get the 16-bit versions or the original computer game. Uh, then I played the Super Nintendo version, which I did that through emulation. Apparently that game was not ever released. Um, and I could probably see why. It's a pretty tough one. It just, uh, yeah, no matter how precise I am in that version, it, it never seemed like, uh, uh, I don't know. It never seemed like I had full control over the game, whereas the Lynx and Genesis versions, I could dominate. I can get through the whole game, um, you know, be very precise with attacking the enemies and whatnot. But the, uh, the Super Nintendo version, I, I wasn't able to do that. Maybe that's one reason why they didn't release that. Maybe it wasn't fully finished. At least, from what the Wikipedia page says, it was unreleased. But, uh, I don't know, I haven't researched it enough. Uh, if it was released, let me know, guys. Uh, but it, I know it definitely wasn't out in America. But I know there's always the possibility it could have hit in uh, Europe or Australia or something like that. Some places like that. Um, and those are really the only versions of this game I have played. Um, Shadow of the Beast originated on the, the Amiga computers, and then it was ported to other platforms. I think it was on the ZX Spectrum, I think it was on the Commodore 64. Uh, there was an Atari ST version, which unfortunately it wasn't very good from the videos I've seen. Um, which is actually a shame because I just recently busted out my Atari ST and I was hoping that version would be good. Um, but there's no point in me trying it now because I've seen videos and it's not good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I originated on the Amiga and that's probably the best version to play because it's got really, really smooth looking visuals, very colorful. And because of the, the Amiga's sort of sample based sound hardware, it's, uh, it, the game sounds amazing. Uh, it sounds way better than this version does. But uh, I'm still the most nostalgic about this version though because it was the first one I played. And I still like coming back to it. So now that I've rambled your ears off for the last 15 minutes after beating the game, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up here, guys. Uh, as usual, I want to say thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing if you're new to my channel. And I will be back with some new Let's Plays soon. Uh, actually, very, very soon, uh, once October 1st hits, uh, which is actually going to be a few days from now, I am going to be pumping out Let's Plays of... The Castlevania series. Now, a lot of you guys know I'm a huge Castlevania fan, so I'm actually kind of looking forward to doing this. Uh, so expect lots and lots of Castlevania Let's Plays for all of October. So with that, guys, I'm out. Uh, take care, take it easy, and I will see you guys soon.